guests do we want to schedule? What kind of topics? This do we meeting want to cover? is being recorded. Um, so that is largely what we'll be doing in the meeting. And then a lot of it is going to be like, okay, we're going to schedule something for this day in the summer. You know, I'm going to say, hey, can somebody um, own, you know, getting that on the calendar? Or, you know, if we want to have a special speaker, can somebody take on, you know, reaching out to that person? So that's a lot of what we'll be doing is it's going to be a, a working meeting. Um, if anyone is interested in helping with that, um, we would love to have you join us. So if you're interested in helping us with that, um, and you've received the chapter update for February. That was an email that we sent out in the first week. Uh, that'll have a link where you can go to find the Zoom meeting for that. It will be a virtual meeting. Um, if you're a newer member, so you haven't received a chapter update at this point, um, please just shoot us an email at wildonesgreatercleveland at gmail.com, um, and I can send that information over to you. So, yep, really looking forward to it. Thank you, Steph, but I apologize. I forgot to hit the recording button. So uh, Danielle, your, your notes from this meeting will be that much more important. <laughs> um, all right, uh, next, as mentioned, we have the Native Pathway Project team kickoff. This is also members only. So if you're are interested in, um, and you're not a member, you know, please be sure to sign up or if you have questions or concerns, reach out to us and we can send you those individual invites. I know a few of you have already been kind enough to at least be a part of the kickoff meeting. Um, so I believe Josh and I think Peggy and obviously Julie. Uh, so thank you guys for who have already volunteered to be a part of this um, and anybody else, you know, more the merrier. So this will be on March 2nd. Um, we're just finalizing the time and then we'll start sending out the, the invites with regards to that. Next is our Seeds and Social event. Uh, so this will be our first social of the year, uh, but it is also going to be a functional meeting. So uh, just like the event we had in January, uh, we'll be packaging some seeds so that way those could be distributed in other future events, especially our Earth Day event. Um, also free seeds for anybody that, that shows up. Um, I definitely know we'll have tons of milkweed seeds. I'm not 100% sure as to some of the other seeds that will be available. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, this is, like I said, a social event, uh, potluck style. So there's gonna be lots of really great food. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, so it's gonna be roughly one to five. And uh, the first part is gonna be that brochure folding, seed packaging, and then last, the middle part, we're gonna at least take an hour break <laughs> and let everyone eat. Uh, there is a pool so people can swim. Uh, kid, you know, this is going to be a kid friendly event, bring friends and family. Um, now, there might be limited pack parking, so this will probably be a registration a type of event. Um, and it will a little bit be dependent upon weather, because obviously, as even though we're talking March and our weather has been gorgeous, we know how, how quickly the weather can turn. So, um, but we are, uh, that is scheduled for March 12th. And uh, we'll be we setting up the event for that. Uh, next, our next chapter meeting, um, for those who are newer, uh, our chapter meetings are always the third Thursday of every month. Uh, so that will be March 16th. Um, same thing with our April. And then as you can see on here, we have our Earth Day event on here. We just have, uh, it's a little bit of a TBD as we, we finalize those last bit of plans. Um, so more to come. We obviously have a lot more scheduling out that we're looking to finalize in the next month. All right. Um, so before we jump into Steph's about Wild Ones, any quick questions about some of those chapter updates or, or meetings and activities? Okay. All right. Well, Steph, take it away. There we go. You just have to turn the audio on. That's pretty helpful. 
Um, all right, thanks, Jess. Um, so yeah, like we mentioned earlier, if you're currently a Wild Ones member, you've been in the um, chapter for a while, you know what we're about, you know, you might not want to sit through all of this, but for folks who are newer or who maybe haven't joined us our, our chapter yet, um, we did just want to share some information about Wild Ones um, and give you a little, a little more of a deep dive into the history of the organization, what our mission is, why we think that's important, and then also some, some more information on what Wild Ones can do for you um, and how you can benefit from a lot of the resources that the national level organization provides. Um, so a, about Wild Ones, it's a national 501c3 charitable organization. We work to advance education about native plants and their use in landscaping in our communities. Wild Ones is based in Wisconsin and is sustained in large part by member dues and donations. Um, the small staff, there's a small staff at the national office. Um, they offer support, resources, and guidance, um, but the real heart of the Wild Ones community is the chapters. Um, so those volunteer chapters um, and volunteer national boards, they oversee and guide the structure, the vision, the mission of the organization. Um, so it really is a grassroots effort to run the organization and to figure out, you know, what are our priorities, um, both at, at our chapter level and then also at a national level. Um, Jess has got the slide up here. Um, as of last month, and I was just, actually this is more recent than that because I updated these slides like two days ago. Um, there are 77 chapters um, in 30 states. We also have 28 seedlings. Um, and seedlings are kind of what you might call like a, like a baby chapter. Um, so seedlings are chapters that have not yet met all of the requirements necessary to become a fully chartered chapter, but they are well on their way. Um, so again, Wild Ones, it is a very Midwest organization. We were founded in Wisconsin. And as you can see from the map, um, there's a lot of density of those chapters sort of in the Midwest area. Um, so we're expanding across the country. More and more people are realizing how important it is to have native plants and how important native plants and native wildlife are to our local ecosystems. So we're expecting that these chapters are just going to continue to grow in number and in size as we expand across the country. Jess, if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So Wild Ones is rooted in continuing education. Um, and what I mean by that is it came out of an effort to learn about native plants and conservation. So in 1977, there was a handful of individuals who attended a lecture by conservationist and activist Lori Otto at an Audubon workshop in Milwaukee. Um, these folks were inspired by Otto's work, and so they began to refer to themselves as Wild Ones, and that's how we got the first chapter sprouting into existence. Um, and that started really cultivating a community of support for native landscapes, because the founders realized that the benefits of native plants and native gardening, um, they bring so many benefits, just not, not only just to your garden, um, but also to the larger ecosystems that your gardens are gonna be a part of. Um, and also helps you just establish a closer connection with nature, which really helps us appreciate, uh, you know, the ecosystems that we're embedded within. Jess, if we could move to the next slide. Thank you. So what is our mission? Wild One's mission, we promote environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. Wild One's focuses on promoting native plant palettes and landscaping practices that will preserve and nurture the variety of life in the world around us. It is the only national organization focused on native plants, and our vision is to become the most widely recognized advocate for natural landscapes and regenerative landscaping practices. Jess, if we can move to the slide on values, let's talk a little bit about our values really quickly. Our mission stems from our respect for the diverse species on this planet and our concern for future generations. So all members are valued and given personalized support to network, to learn locally and be recognized for their efforts. Um, as an organization, we are committed to offering educational resources that provide research-based evidence about native plants and their benefits. So why do we want to focus on native plants? I think that if, if you don't know yet, we're going to really get into it. So Jess, if we could move to the next slide here. Why do we care so much about native plants? Native plants are critical to ecosystem health because they form the foundation for regional food webs. 
Plants absorb minerals from the soil and pull carbon from the air. They convert solar energy into food using those resources. Um, we can't do that. People can't do that. Animals can't do that. Uh, we can heat our homes. We can power our cars with social with solar energy. Um, I'm actually personally excited because just last week, my fiance and I decided that we are getting solar panels on our house. So I should have that up by summer. Pretty pumped about that. Um, but we can't eat sunlight. So we kind of need the plants to do it for us. Um, people can eat plants and some people will consume other animals that also eat plants, you know, so if you're an omnivore, um, but our diets depend on plants, which means that our diets also depend on the ability of insects that live and eat those plants to both pollinate and consume plants. So why bugs? Julie heard me saying later, I, earlier, I like all the spooky, slimy, scaly things. I love bugs. I'm excited to talk about bugs. Um, Jess, if we could move to the next slide. Let's talk about host plants. So many, many insects in the environment are specialists. Um, they tend to feed on and pollinate a very narrow spectrum of plant life um, and sometimes just a single species. So as you all can see here, this is a, a um, monarch butterfly caterpillar that we're looking at here. Um, you may know about these because you know they're very popular. People are really invested in saving monarch butterflies. My mom down in Florida dedicates her summer to growing milkweed and then going around and finding every little caterpillar she can and like rescuing them and putting them in a safe environment before they get eaten by birds so that she can maximize the number of butterflies that come out of her garden each year. Um, monarch butterflies, they have a very specific relationship with milkweed. Um, so that's just one example of an insect that is dependent on a single native plant to survive and to thrive. And we need those butterflies to, 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 to survive. We need those. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the entomologist, Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, but he's a, a professor at the University of Delaware, which is actually my alma mater. I was very excited to learn about this. Um, but he's done a lot of work on the importance of bugs in native environments. And he reports that 90% of the insects that eat plants can develop and reproduce only on the plants with which they share an evolutionary history. So it is very, very important for those insect populations that we maintain the biodiversity and the native plants that they need in order to survive. Because those bugs help to pollinate the plants that feed us. So this is really important. If we wanna get dinner on our plates, we gotta save these native plants. Jess, if we could move to the next slide. So, uh, this is really important, particularly in a time of biodiversity crisis. So reports point to a 60% decline in the size of populations of mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians um, since about 1970. And since then, over about 1 million species are projected to go extinct in the next 50 years if we don't set enough habitat aside to support them. More than 40% of insect species are declining, a third are endangered. Reports indicate that insect populations are declining by as much as 2.5% annually, which is pretty big. At this rate, we're looking at a mass extinction within a century. Um, insects are essential, essential for the proper functioning of all ecosystems because they're food for other creatures, they're pollinators, they're decomposers, they're recyclers of nutrients. When we don't have the ecosystem services that bugs provide, our food system can collapse. So we're seeing some alarm bells here and we wanna make sure that we are preserving these environments. What is the best way to do that? That's where we start talking again about native plants. Jess, if we could move to the next slide. So um, let's bring in this back around to Wild Ones and our specific mission. The five primary global threats to biodiversity are changes in land and sea use, um, climate change, pollution, the over-exploitation of species and invasive species and disease. Many of these, many of these drivers of the, the, the threats to biodiversity, many of those are actually related to each other and they compound one another. Wild ones, our primary focus is on ad addressing the degradation and loss of wildlife habitat. Um, one of the biggest examples, and I'm sure a lot of people have probably seen this already, um, is suburban housing developments. 
native so when when we put in suburban housing tracks, we disturb a lot of those native soils. Sometimes we're just stripping them out of the earth entirely. Um, they get damaged when ground is excavated, when it's leveled, when those houses get built, when roads and driveways are paved, uh, when lawns and non-native foundation plants are put in, when those street trees are put in. Um, so that soil disturbance, frequent mowing, liberal irrigation, um, that invites opportunistic uh, weeds and non-native weeds that can come in. Um, and that also prompts the over application of herbicides, which can be damaging to native plants. When one of these non-native ornamental plants, so I'm thinking here of like calorie pears, Japanese barberry, English ivy, when those escape from our gardens and start to proliferate into adjacent open spaces, uh, local ecosystems become degraded because those invasive species start um, taking up uh, space, they take up resources, sometimes they are literally choking out the native plants in that area. So as a conservation organization, Wild Ones focuses on restoring habitat value to those landscapes um, so that we can try to heal some of that degradation that has resulted from human activity. Jess, if we could move to the next slide here. Um, so let's talk some more about native plants. So why do we want to work with native plants? Um, landscaping with native plants helps to restore those healthy and natural ecosystems that we know are so valuable. Um, they provide food and shelter for insects and birds. They're the foundation of terrestrial food webs. They enable insects, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, all those populations to thrive. Native gardens are a buffet for bees, butterflies, and other sorts of pollinators. Farms and gardens that are interplanted with native plants actually result in higher crop yields. So, you know, it's not just about everybody needs to grow vegetables in their own garden. If we want agriculture to work, native plants are our friend in that effort. Like they are gonna help us have better crop yields. So again, human life is dependent on those healthy pollinator populations um, because they're responsible for about one in every three bites of food that we take. And they increase our nation's crop values each year by more than 15 billion. Uh, $15 billion, excuse me. Um, so native plants play an important role in combating the climate crisis because they help to remove carbon from the air through photosynthesis. Um, those really deep roots that a lot of our native plants have, um, they're really effective at capturing and storing carbon. Um, and so they're actually holding a lot of that underground, which is also helping to take the carbon out of our um, atmosphere and helping to heal the ozone layer that we know is oh so important. Um, so if you're looking to reduce your carbon footprint, um, or if you're working with a company that is interested in reducing their carbon footprint, there are ways to do that by incorporating native plants into gardening and landscaping um, areas, excuse me. That, that itself uh, could be a whole other presentation. Um, so we might try to have an educational session just about that sometime later this year, because there's a lot to unpack there. Jess, if we could move to the next slide. So native plants, they're well adapted to regional soils, winds, freeze and thaw cycles, um, and just the, you know, the whims of mother nature. Uh, they tend to thrive under natural conditions. They tend to do better when they're neglected uh, by gardeners who might otherwise be over attentive to plants. They require minimal input. They usually don't need a ton of fertilizer um, or supplemental water or significant maintenance work once they've been established. They have really robust and deep root systems. Um, so if you've ever seen the root system for native plants, a lot of time what you're looking at is these very fibrous networks. Like it's usually not just one single tap root, it'll be a whole network of roots that really grounds that plant into the dirt and also holds on to a lot of ground, which helps to mitigate um, excess runoff uh, from stormwater, reduces erosion, um, and helps to filter out excess nutrients, heavy metals, other things that would you know, otherwise damage water quality. So again, those native plants, a lot of value to having those in our ecosystem. So where do we go from here? Jess, if we could go to the next slide, there you go. Um, this is why it is so, so important for us to be planting these native gardens. So how do you begin to landscape with native plants? One of the best things you can do as a first step is to reduce the non-functional turf areas in your yard. Um, 
Jess knows this. Some of the other folks here know this. My fiance and I moved into this house last year. We've been here about, about a year. I've been able to watch my yard for the full year and kind of study, okay, where does the sun go, you know, during the different seasons? Where does the sunlight fall during the day? You know, how do things work around here? What areas tend to get flooded when it rains? What areas tend to dry out first? Um, and so I'm excited this spring to finally start cutting into some of the turf that we have in our lawn and start replacing it with flower beds. Um, and those flower beds, you guessed it, they're mostly going to be native plants. The only exception is going to be some amaryllis bulbs that my mom gave me um, a couple of years ago because those are just personally important. Um, but I take those up every fall and put them back in every spring. Um, so yeah, trimming your turf, that is a great way to uh, reduce that non-functional area and make more space for native plants to come in. Um, planting butterfly gardens. There's a lot of native plants that are really popular with butterflies. Um, that provides pollen and also nectar. Um, and uh, there's a variety of native plants where if you, if you plant the right kind of varieties, you can get blooms everywhere from early spring into the late fall to make sure that you've always got something interesting that you want to look at in that garden. Um, we want to make sure that we're including uh, host plants for larva. So again, milkweed is a great example of this, as well as grasses and some perennials that will allow for overwintering habitat for those species that we're trying to encourage. Um, rain gardens are another great opportunity to incorporate native plants into your gardening. Um, these are designed to mitigate stormwater runoff, um, and they also help to absorb excess rain and any snow melt that we might have. Right now is a great time to be thinking about that because you probably got a lot of water moving around in your land. Um, so it's a great time to start looking at where can we put in a rain garden. Um, rain gardens work really, really well when they're planted near roads, driveways, sidewalks, other impermeable surfaces where you might get that water shedding off then you, that could cause an erosion issue. So that's where you put the rain garden is to just really help absorb that excess water. You wanna try to channel water away from structural foundations because um, that's also gonna help with maintaining the integrity of your house. Um, let's see. And then uh, you can also plant a tree. Oak trees are native to North America. They are highly beneficial for insect populations. Um, in a lot of regions, they support more moth and butterfly species as larval host plants than any other genus of native trees. So they can be extremely valuable. An urban oak tree can actually host over 500 species of caterpillars, while something like, let's say a non-native ginkgo is only gonna host one species of, category, of caterpillar. Um, so a lot of different ways that we can start to incorporate these native plants into our gardens. Um, again, for chapter members who have been around for at least a couple months, um, in one of our more recent chapter updates, we included some information from last month's chapter meeting that was shared about um, becoming a master rain gardener. There actually is a program, and I cannot remember who is sponsoring it, but um, there is a local program to help you become a master rain gardener and plan for those rain gardens in your own space. All right, Jess, if we could move to the, I think this is my last sort of lectury slide. Um, so again, talking about Doug Tallamy, one of our favorites, he's actually an honorary director of Wild Ones um, and has written a book called Nature's Best Hope. Um, he shares that one of the big mistakes in our approach to conservation is the idea that nature is something that happens over there. It's somewhere else. When in fact, nature is all around us, it is what we are living in all the time. Um, we can no longer leave conservation just to the conservationists. We all have to be part of this solution to solve some of the big issues you know, related to climate change and the impact that that's gonna have as we're going into the rest of the century and into future generations. So let's talk about what Wild Ones can do to help you do that. Jess, if we could move to actually two slides up, um, we'll talk about a few national programs that we have. Um, the one that has gotten a lot of press coverage recently is our native garden designs. So Wild Ones actually offers 19, we're up to 19 now, eco-region specific free native garden designs. Um, they added, I think it was another 11 this year. Uh, so previously we had eight, we're up to 19 now, um, and some of those just got added this year. 
Um, so I think I've got a link in one of the following slides uh, so you guys can go see what those native garden designs look like. Um, but they're for all sorts of different ecoregions. Um, Toledo is in there, um, as well as areas like Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, St. Louis. Um, there's one for Grand Rapids. Um, try, I'm trying to think if there was another Midwest one. But there are a lot of different um, native garden designs that can kind of serve as inspiration um, if you're looking to start native garden or native plant gardening in your own yard. Jess, if we could move to the next slide. Oh, more about native gardens. Um, so yeah, the designs for these native garden designs, these were developed to demonstrate that native gardens are both beautiful and achievable. Um, they're very DIY, they're very budget conscious designs. They can be tailored to fit different sized and shaped residential lots. And if we move to the next slide, Jess, um, they also allow you to take an incremental approach. I don't know about you guys, but this is the one part that I find the most valuable because I'm not going to make over my entire yard in a single year. I know that this is something that I'm going to invest in every year for quite a while um, to make sure that I am maximizing the native plant presence that I can create in my own space while also, you know, working with my own time limitations and sometimes even my funding limitations to make that happen. So if you're interested in seeing these native garden designs, you can go to nativegardendesigns.wildones.org um, to take a look at those. Really encourage you to spend some time looking at them because even if you're looking at garden designs for eco regions that are not your own, it's still super cool to see how they're laid out and get some ideas. Um, so definitely encourage you to do that. Jess, if we could move to the next slide, a couple more things that the national level Wild Ones does. Um, we have seeds for education grants. So these are the, this is the Lori Otto Seeds for Education program. Um, it's named for honorary director uh, Lori Otto, who is the founding inspiration for Wild Ones. Um, so if you know of a local school, a nature center, an after school care program, a community center, a youth group located in the US that needs funding for a native plant garden or habitat so they can do some hands on learning, encourage them to apply for uh, a Seeds for Education program grant um, because that will help them fund you know, the materials, the resources that they need in order to do that education. Um, Jess, if we could move to the next slide, we've got a little more about Seeds for Education. So the grants are awarded um, each year up to $500 to schools and youth engagement organizations to cover the purchase of native plants and seeds for programs that are going to excuse me are going to engage youth in planning, in planting, and caring for those native plant gardens. Um, so this approach not only gets more native plants in the ground, which again is something we really want to promote, but it also helps to teach those future stewards of the land to be mindful of some of these topics around native plants and the importance of native biodiversity. And I think the last slide, nope, last couple slides we've got here, um, educational web webinars. Hey, it's my favorite guy, Doug Tallamy again. Um, Wild One will often host free educational webinars that are open to the public um, featuring big names in biodiversity and native plant gardening like Larry Wiener, Matthew Wa uh, Ross, Heather home, Dr. Doug Tallamy. Um, I was checking this calendar today and I don't think we have any national level Wild Ones seminars coming up anytime soon, um, but they do happen. And if you join Wild Ones or if you already have, you should get national level emails and updates about events like this um, as they come up in the future. Jess, if we can move to the next slide, let's talk about the quarterly digital journal. Um, so this is a quarterly journal that is full of articles on native plants, member and public gardens, uh, restoration products, book reviews, all sorts of fun native plant gardening related things. Um, you'll receive digital copies of the journal through email. There's also an archive of past journals available on the Wild Ones website. Um, and that's available for public viewing. You don't have to be a member to view that journal. Um, so that is also another resource that is really useful to start looking through. If it's still a little cold for you to be doing any gardening, this is a good time to do some reading and get some inspiration on what you can do in your native plant garden. Last thing here, Jess, if we could move to the last slide, is our annual members photo contest. So every year um, at the close of the summer, we have a national level annual Wild Ones photo contest. Um, native plants as great as they are, 
They're not always great at marketing and selling themselves. So they can use a little bit of help from our members. Um, so if you happen to have native plants in your garden and you take some really awesome photos and you are like, wow, this is really demonstrating this plant and showcasing it as the best that it can be. And, you know, really what it what it does to benefit the, the biodiversity in our area. Um, we would love to see you submit those. Um, those images will be used by wild ones in educational and promotional materials. Um, including some of the pictures that you've seen in this slideshow today. Um, so this this photo right here from Joan Brandwine uh, is a 2020 Best in Show winner. Um, and I think it's a, just a great example of not only how awesome these native plants look, but also look at this relationship that it's got with this happy little bee doing its pollinating, doing exactly what we need it to do to help our biodiversity thrive. Um, so please, um, Keep an eye on that. Uh, there'll probably be some announcements coming out um, when the um, submissions for the annual photo contest opens up. Um, we'd love to see what photos you're taking as you're working in your native plant gardens. Um, so bottom line here, we've talked a lot of, about a lot of information, but the bottom line is this is Wild Ones. This is who we are in a nutshell, or a pine cone, or a seed pod, pick your favorite. Um, but the message is simple. Plant native plants, that's really all we need to do um, to help to you know, improve the biodiversity that we're concerned about, to help maintain the security and the res resiliency of our food networks, um, and to help you know, just keep and preserve and, cons and conserve um, a natural world that we all wanna be in, um, both for ourselves and for those future generations. Um, and Jess, if we've got to go to the last, very last slide, I promise. Um, if you're not currently following us on Facebook or Instagram, we do have some information there. Um, you can follow us. I think both of those is just Wild Ones Greater Cleveland. Um, we're pretty active on Facebook. We're a little less active on Instagram, um, but we do try to share a lot of really cool information as it comes across our desks, or if anyone sends us anything really cool, we try to share it as well. Um, so. Please um, enjoy all of the resources that Wild Ones has to offer. Uh, make sure that you're reading those national newsletters, those chapter updates, stay in touch with us. There's just, there is a wealth of information here to help you on your journey. And that is all for me, Jess, thank you. Yes, well, thank you, Steph. That was a fantastic overview of our, our mission history and uh, you know the importance of, of native plants. So. You know, um, for those of you that are, are are just you know listening in and you know just learning more about wild ones, you know please consider being a member. Um, as Steph mentioned at the beginning, um, those membership dues. Uh, well, actually, she didn't mention this part, but it is tax deductible because we are a cha charitable institution, uh, a nonprofit, and um, so th those members uh, membership dues go towards both the local chapter, but the national level to help you know, with like the grants as well as the other activities. So it's really important to help, you know, contributing to it towards our mission. So um, it, it's, it's very important. So to recap, obviously we have a lot of things going on, a lot of things in the hopper. So if you're interested in, in uh, you know, joining us, please do so. If you are interested in any of those projects, committees, or other uh, areas that we need help with sooner than later, please raise your hand, send us a message either via Facebook or through our email. Um, feel free to invite a friend. You know, like I said, one of our core pieces to our mission is that spreading that awareness, even if it's just at the basic level, you know, just, you, you don't need to know anything about it. Just invite a friend, uh, have some fun, like what with our social event, uh, in March, um, and you know, just join us, have have fun, learn something, and, and spread that knowledge. So, um, Steph, Danielle, anything else that you guys want to add? Okay. All right. Well, we are we are pretty much done. So I want to open the floor up because I think I saw several other people join late. Uh, so anybody have any questions about the organization, about volunteering, or maybe you're just new and you didn't have a chance to introduce yourself at the beginning. So let me open up the floor. I'll stop sharing. 
let me just. So Jess, I just want to address uh, one of the questions. I'm, I'm looking back through the chat now. Um, and we did have a question about whether that presentation is going to be available. Um, we will have a recording of the meeting that we'll send out in the next chapter update so that you can go back and rewatch that, download it um, as you will. And then we'll also have um, meeting minutes. Um, and Danielle, I know you're out there. Um, if you want to send me a note, I can try to take all the like content that was in that deck um, and I can try to summarize, summarize that into a document that we can share with folks so they have it on hand. That would be great. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Like I said, the, the meeting minutes will be very important this time, <laughs> Danielle, since I missed the recording at the beginning. Um, it looks like I see some other notes on here from people. Um, looks like Nick has uh, a possible native garden project that we might want to be looking at. And uh, Julie is mentioning some possible Earth Day events, I believe, at Lake and Summit County Metro Parks. So we'll have to look back at that. The Lake County one is the day after Earth Day. So I don't know if that makes it easier or harder to be part of. Nope, fair, fair enough. No, that's good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Um. Oh, okay, Laura. Um, so, did, Laura, I, I saw your one idea. Did you want to share a little bit more about that? Oh, for the science fair. Yes. Oh, well, and you got to yeah. and you got to introduce Jack. Oh, here's Jack. <laughs> you got to put him uh, through that, that that grueling activity since you already had to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm, I said I'm signing us up for things without you here. Um, yeah, so, um, well, actually, whenever you started talking about a science fair, um, if, we're, if we're trying to come up with ideas for what we might want to do, um, Jack's mother has worked at Hale Farm down in um, Akron, Cuyahoga Falls, for forever. Mm -hmm. And she teaches natural dyeing, so using plants to dye wool and teaches you how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be some, some fun things we could learn and take to a science fair if uh, we're looking for anything like that. But mm -hmm. just wanted to share. Uh, that well, sounds like a cool activity, and, a, and especially if it's using native plants. I mean, that might even be a fun activity for a our chapter, who knows, maybe tie dye shirts or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she would love it. She would love to teach all of us something. <laughs> Laura and Jack, I'm just going to say as a knitter, I'm very interested in this natural wool dyeing. I'm very interested. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Maybe we'll bring her on one day. We'll like go to her house for <laughs> one of the monthly meetings and you all can meet her <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, a little guest appearance that'd be great yeah. <laughs> great well i think i see uh, two new people that were on at the beginning so connie ann or, or crystal would you like to hop on and say hi and do a little introduction hi hi crystal i don't know if my can you guys hear me yep um, yeah, I'm the one that uh, asked for the um, the slide to be shared, so I can refer back to it. Uh, it's very interesting, and actually, my children, just as you know, um, they're actually sitting next to me, and they've been listening, and they're so interested. And they're a teenager boy and a middle school girl, so <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, I'm excited that you're able to join us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Patty Ann? Okay. Um, I'm using my phone for the first time instead of the computer, and <laughs> I don't know what to do. But um, I'm looking at the memberships. Would I look at a household membership? So that is completely up to you. I mean, if, if you have people in your household, then I would definitely recommend that. And what you can do, and actually, Laura and Jack, this can go for you too, because I know you just signed up. But when you do a household membership, you have the ability to break out sub memberships 
So that way, um, like, because example, different households may have different emails and, you know, some people more participating than others. And this way also for certain members only events, that way there's no trouble in like, you know, ever, uh, you know, both of you could sign up for something or one of you things along those lines. So you're not relying on the email. So that the household one is a really good option, especially when you need those sub accounts. Um, for anybody that's a business, uh, there's business ones as well. There's a few other options on there. Um, there's also a student um, one, um, which is really great too. Um, but the student one does not have that ability to do, to do the household piece. Okay. Well, it sounds very interesting. Um, being I live right between Cleveland and Toledo. <laughs> Um, Join us. I know you and your family come out and visit us often. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I'd be happy to do things that I could do on the internet too, like if you need help with your website or something. Yeah. So Danielle, Connie Ann is the one that's been kind enough to give us that ticket um, to uh, go to the uh, 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 seminar in March. Oh, fine. So D Danielle, uh, Danielle, uh, and awesome. Really appreciate your, your, your reaching out to us on that ticket, Connie. So I'm actually, so do you glad. Connie Ann or do you prefer Connie? I, Connie Ann works because there's bound to be another Connie. <laughs> so, okay. Well, opportunity Connie Ann. Okay. <laughs> so I would I would love to go with it, but I have obligations to my DAR chapter. So <laughs> there I go. <laughs> yeah. Well Connie Ann, we really hope that you join us. But even if you can't like even just joining these meetings, you know, like I said, there's a lot of activities that are open to all. Um, or if you join chapter, you know, because I know you're sort of in between both the greater Cleveland, Northeast Ohio and Toledo, um, but we have a situation with uh, our Youngstown group too. There's some people that are just on that border and, um, you know, we appreciate any help that you have and we welcome all to all of our, okay. most of our activities, you know, we share with them constantly. Um, we're just excited to have more people join us and help our efforts. And we already appreciate, uh, like I said, the offer of, of the one ticket. So thank you so much for that. Oh, I'm so glad. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, I do have a pollinator garden, but it appears to be too small. It, the plants get so big. <laughs> That's okay. We'll help you. <laughs> okay, good. And plus I have more to land to dig up. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, thank you. All right, anybody else that wants to speak or have any other questions? All right, wonderful. Well, thank you guys all for your time. We're really excited about a lot of these activities. Like I said, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. We definitely have a lot going on. Really excited, but honestly, it can't happen without you. So more the merrier and uh, we have a lot of great things coming up, okay? Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. It was great to meet you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye.